I'm going to say. Welcome everyone to the latest in the National Association of Scholars Great American Literature webinar series. Um, today we are doing uh, Native Son by Richard Wright. And I'll just say right now, some of the guiding questions for our distinguished panel, whose names I'll get to in a moment. You know, what makes Native Son a great American novel? James Baldwin once wrote, no American Negro exists who does not have his private bigger Thomas living in his skull. What did he mean by that? Who influenced Wright's writings and who did his writings influence? How would you describe his place in American literature? Now, I am delighted to have three uh, distinguished panelists that we're delighted to have, I should say. <coughs> Uh, Mr. James Campbell is a writer and author who for many years wrote the weekly NB column on the back page of the Times Literary Supplement. Uh, he is the author of many books, not all of which I'm going to list, uh, say now, but we'll put them later mentioned, Talking at the Gates, A Life of James Baldwin, and Exiled in Paris, Richard Wright. Uh, then Mr. Damon Root is a senior editor at Reason, where he wrote law poetry. Among the books he's written about are A Glorious Liberty, Frederick Douglass and the Fight for an Anti-Slavery Constitution, and Overruled, The Long War for Control of the U.S. Supreme Court. And then finally, frankly, my list, but not in alphabetical order, Dr. Jim Hartley is a professor and chair of economics at Mount Holyoke College, where my wife went to college, so it's a great, great place to go. Uh, outside of the economics department, he has taught multiple courses using the great books, including Western Civilization and Introduction Through the Great Books, um, you know, numerous tutorials, and his books include uh, The Represent Representative Agent in Macroeconomics. Um, now, we're going to put more of their books into the chat panel below so that everybody can have a chance to buy them uh, from Amazon, which is what everybody, all good, good and decent people who attend these things to go buy books. We know this. Um, we are going to have 12 to 14 minutes each for ta this in individual talks, then a guided Q&A discussion um, where I and also the other um, I look at the chat and Q&A buttons below um, where you will be putting in your questions. Um, they can also be answered by the panelists who can also just talk with each other and have you know, fun conversation. When I do pick up questions, I don't do them in chronological order. I do them in whatever order seems best for a conversation. And sometimes I come up with questions of my own. If your questions don't get answered, please send me email afterwards, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L at nas.org. So, so I may forward your questions to our panelists who will then have the option to respond to you at their leisure. So don't worry, your questions will get answered. Also, this is being not only live streamed, but recorded for posterity on the NAS YouTube channel. Should be up within 24 hours. So if you have to leave early, you'll get a chance to see the end of this. If you want to show it to your friends, you'll get a chance to tell, get, send them a link. Having said all that, um, Professor, uh, not Professor Campbell, Mr. Campbell, uh, may, would you be so kind as to go first? Yes, thank you. Uh, not Professor, just a, a humble scribe. Um, I first read Native Son uh, when I was at university in Edinburgh, in Scotland, in 1977, 78. Um, there, there was a, an American literature course, which I uh, specialized in. And of course, we read uh, the three big ones. We read uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin. We read uh, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. And we read Native Son. In addition to uh, a great many other things, we read a tremendous amount on that course. I, I, in fact, I sometimes wonder if I'm ahead of my times or behind my times, because I read in the newspapers these days uh, students complaining or even professors complaining uh, about decolonizing the curriculum. Well, this is the mid seventies in Scotland. And really we had a black segment, an African-American segment in our literature course. We had a native American segment, a 
in the literature course. We had a Jewish American segment in the literature course. And uh, boy, oh boy, we had to read a lot of books. And one of the ones uh, that was most rewarding was Native Son. It's a great novel. It was a revelation. Um, there were so many revelations. And I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to reread it for the purposes of this discussion. Um, it's, uh, it's not without its flaws. It, it's, it's too long, it's verbose, particularly in the final part. That's been said by many. And uh, I, having read it again, I think it's true. That's the section with the lawyer. When Bigger Thomas, the central character, is in prison and he's talking with his lawyer. Um, before then, for people who haven't had the chance to look at it recently, I'll uh, just briefly say something about its themes. It's set in Chicago uh, and the, big, the Thomas family is very, very poor. Uh, they live in a building owned by uh, Mr. Dalton and uh, they're desperately poor. Their apartment is overrun by rats. Bigger lives with his brother and sister and mother. Um, they're, they're unhappy people. They're, they're downtrodden. And Bigger is looking for work. And he gets work from Mr. Dalton, who happens to be the owner of his tenement building, as well as many, many, many others. But they're, they're good they're good intentioned people, the Daltons. Um, and, and this is one of the conflicts that Wright throws up in the novel. And, and that's one of the great features of the novel, particularly in its first two parts, that Wright throws up these, uh, these, these conflicts in the reader's mind. These are good people, the Daltons. But, you know, they are, as Bigger repeatedly tells us, they're rich, they're white, they're privileged, to use the, the, the current fashionable term. Um, and, but they, they want to do their best by the Negroes, which is the, the current term in the book. Um, they, they give money to charity uh, to improve the lives of young black people. Anyway, Bigger gets the job as the chauffeur to the family, and uh, on his first outing, he chauffeurs the Dalton's daughter, Mary Dalton. Um, and she's a very privileged girl, but she's not going where you might expect her to go. She's going to meet her communist boyfriend. She's a member of the Communist Party, as, by the way, Richard Wright was when he wrote Native Son. And that led him into a little bit of trouble, but we'll maybe come to that. Anyway, the, the horrible outcome is that uh, Bigger taking Mary home, she's dead drunk, and not long after, I'm afraid to say she's dead. Uh, half accidentally, Bigger um, suffocates her. You'll have to read the novel to get the full horror of it, but it's a, it's a, it's a bit brilliantly uh, handled scene by Rick. And then Bigger kind of eventually goes on the run uh, and, and he commits another murder, which is of his girlfriend, Bessie. And um, it's a very, very affecting scene. Or the scenes leading up to it are very affecting. It's terrific. It really displays the gifts of Richard Wright. He wrote the book, I think he was 31 or 32, if uh, not younger. He was... It was was finished in 1939, ready for publication in 1939. Um, it was finally published in 1940, and Richard Wright was born in 1908. So if my arithmetic serves me, that makes him 31, 32, when he wrote it. It was a work of tremendous maturity for a man who was brought up in poverty unimaginable in Mississippi, and not just poverty, but family circumstances, practically beyond the reach of the imagination of the people, certainly, I, I think, on, on this panel. I hope I'm not being presumptuous. Um, it's really dreadful and um, tremendous force of character took Richard Wright 
become a novelist, the author of many, many, many books later on. And um, of these three great books that I mentioned by Wright, Baldwin, and Ellison, I think Invisible Man is the greatest of these novels, actually, one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. A Native Son is a first. It's, a, it's, that, it's that thing, it's a black first. <clears throat> not that there were, had not been any black novels before, novels by black writers, but there had been nothing like this. This is terrific. And one of the um, things about it is like watch, watching some gripping movie, it's the relentlessness with which Wright pursues his theme and he forces bigger into these abominable acts. Um, really terrific. There's nothing else like it until then, <clears throat> and possibly since. And that, to me, is one of the marks of great literary production. And, you know, uh, the poems of Emily Dickinson, for example, there was nothing else like it. The early stories of Ernest Hemingway, there's nothing else like it. The, the early essays in particular of James Baldwin, they're unexpected. There's nothing else like it. And Native Son comes into that, and it's, as long as people are reading books, they'll read that one. Um, uh, I'm going to say, uh, before I say much more and before I hand over, um, I'm going to throw the cat among the pigeons. There are two texts of Native Son. One is the one that was published in 1940. And that's the one I've got here that I read in this uh, lovely Penguin edition. When I was at university, this is my copy. And then in 1991, the Library of America, overseen by uh, Arnold Rampersad, published what was called a restored text of Native Son. And what this uh, consists of is an earlier proof, what we nowadays call a galley. Uh, Native Son was all set up, was all ready to go. And then um, writes editor at Harper and Brothers, Edward Aswell, very highly respected uh, editor, and had a very good relationship with Wright. He informed him that the Book of the Month Club was interested in the book. Now, the Book of the Month Club in those days, this was a tremendous deal. You know, I think probably even opera doesn't come in comparison. The Book of the Month Club in the 1930s, 1939, 1940. But Edward Aswell said to write, they want, they demand some, well, demand, uh, they want some concessions. And this uh, required Wright to take out some stuff which uh, Edward Aswell said, pretty raw. Um, and it really, the, the main thing, the, the thing that people have always concentrated on was the scene in a cinema, Bigger Thomas and his friend Jack, and they're in the cinema and they start masturbating. And this was, this was 1940, 1939. Uh, the Book of the Month Club, people thought this was a bit raw. Now, my point is this. Ever since then, people have said, including uh, Richard Wright's daughter, Julia, and Mr. Rampersad, Professor Rampersad himself, and perhaps even Ellen Wright, uh, Richard Wright's widow, whom I met on a number of occasions, that the, the novel was censored. Uh, it turned out that these passages were excised. It was really only that one, but together with some other passages that were changed, and the novel was then published, and Richard Wright made a tremendous amount of money out of it. Massive bestseller, even in the Harper and Brothers edition. Sold 
quarter of a million copies, not to mention one. And he became very rich and he bought a beautiful house in Paris. And everything. So great for him. But ever since, people have said the novel was censored. Now, it's not censored if your publisher says, we will publish it as it is, as we have it in the galley. But if you want to make a lot of money from the Book of the Month Club, it's up to you. Do you want to make the concession? And Richard Wright should. Okay. Now, my point about the Library of America edition, this beautiful edition, of course, here it is, is that it presents this as if it was censorship, which it wasn't. And it introduces what was at the time in 1991, thereabouts, a rather fashionable concept, the restored text. All I have to say about that is that the, the text that, now the restored text and is now the established text, because if you go into Barnes and Noble and buy Native Son, you are buying um, what we might call for um, lack of a better term, and I mean no disrespect, of course, uh, what we might call the Rampartide edition, that's what you buy in paperback in Barnes and Noble. And that's an edition that Richard Wright never approved. Within 20 years of life remaining to Richard Wright after the publication of Sun, in letters, in diaries, in recorded conversations, in essays, he never expressed any disapproval of the changes he had made. And I will stop in a second, I promise you. All I'm going to say, I worked for over 30 years as an editor at the Times Literary Supplement. And I know, and anyone who's worked as an editor knows this, that an author, whether it's an article or a book, an author will say, oh, I don't want to change a word. And the editor tries to persuade him, as Edward Aswell had to persuade Richard Wright. And they come to a happy settlement. And then the article or the book is published. And later on, the author might say, you know what, you were right. It's better like this. And I'm not saying that this uh, edition is the better one. All I'm saying is that in the in absence of evidence to the contrary, I think it's presumptuous to have given the world an edition that Wright actually rejected. Because he chose the other one. He, he could have chosen uh, the, the one with the, uh, the raunchy detail. So anyway, I'm just throwing that in. And if people uh, want to contradict me, uh, we can certainly talk about it. Here we go, it's a, it's a wonderful book. There are many things about Richard Wright's life. Uh, that are, oh gosh, he lived a complicated life right up until the moment of his death, which even until this day is controversial and disputed. Some people think that he was poisoned in the Eugene, uh, Eugene uh, Gibes clinic where he died. Some people think he was poisoned by agents of the CIA. Uh, I can tell you that he wasn't. But um, people, some people are comforted that maybe he was. That's my, my last one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, lovely hearing you. And I will go on swiftly to uh, Professor Hartley. So thanks so much. Um, and I'm really excited to have this chance to talk about uh, Native Son and in this conversation about the great American novel. Because, because one of the interesting questions is why is it in that conversation at all? And, and I think there's two big reasons that when people think about it, they immediately gravitate towards, right? What makes this one of the great American novels, if not the? And the first is that it's the discussion of race, right? Which is, which is just all over in the text, obviously that, you know, Wright is sitting here wrestling with the legacies of slavery and the reconstruction and all the Jim Crow. And he's just, he's just digging down deep into all of these sorts of problems. 
And if you're reading this novel when it originally came out right after his previous collection, Uncle Tom's Children, I mean, that's what you would notice. I mean, this is a novel about race and all of the problems of race. But then there's another theme that runs through, and it's, you know, as, as James was pointing out earlier, right, right by this time has joined the Communist Party. And so there's the communists in this story who emerges the semi-heroic figures. And so another way to read the novel is it's a novel about class, that, that we have this sort of problems of class. There's the rich people and then the poor people. And so Bigger Thomas is just sort of one of the oppressed lower classes. So that's another way to read it. But, but I think one way you can think about this then is this is partly, in James Baldwin's terms, why is this everybody's protest novel? Well, it doesn't matter what you're protesting, right? Bigger Thomas represents the downtrodden and, and the people who need the help somehow. Um, but, but I think if that's all this novel was, if it was just a novel about race or about class, it's not a great American novel, right? There's, there's a lot of novels about race and about class. I think what makes this novel distinct and different and somehow another rises above it all is that Wright is really wrestling with another, one of the great American themes. And it's this theme of individualism versus society, right? Are we individuals or are we a part of a society at large? And as we watch Bigger Thomas through the novel, what we see is Bigger trying to wrestle with this who is he, you know, is he this individual or is he part of a society? And you can see it sort of in the development of his character, you know, before the murder, the first murder, he's very much just this anonymous person. He has no individuality at all. Nobody sees him as a unique person. He's sort of just going through life, just sort of floating through the scene James talked about in the theater. I think the importance of that scene for Wright originally is, you know, he's in a theater masturbating with his friend. I mean, this is the ultimate pure self-indulgent thing. Somebody else has to clean up the mess and you know, it sort of wanders through life. But then he hits the moment where he murders Mary and it's, it's an accidental murder, right? He's not trying to murder her. He's just trying to keep her quiet. But at that moment, as, as Bigger says, he found the hidden meaning of his life. He suddenly discovered, oh, wait a minute. I can now go through life. Everybody's going to see me as this person from the outside that they've always seen me as just this anonymous person. But he has this hidden secret. He's the guy who killed the rich white girl. And this gives him this individuality, this individual that sort of we watch sort of spill out through the novel as he just keeps discovering over and over again, I matter, I'm important. And we can see this again, the hints of it throughout and his reactions with other people. When he first meets Mary, there's this line in there, this beautiful moment, right, that, that he describes Mary as an odd girl. What's odd about her is that she sees him as a human being, right? And then later in the novel, when he's in prison and he's talking with one of the communists, Jan, and it's like, in bigger notes, it's the first time in his life he'd ever seen a white man as a human being. And so this idea that Bigger is discovering people are human becomes most crystallized after his conversation with Max, the communist lawyer in the prison. And at that moment, Bigger Thomas, he's had this conversation with Max. Max is treating him like a human and Bigger gets this grandiose vision. And the vision he has is of a society where the sun has melted away both color and clothes and he can emerge into this society. And so suddenly there's no color. The race thing has gone for him. There's no clothes standing in for the class thing. And suddenly Bigger Thomas can be this individual standing up there. I think this idea of the individualism is the reason for the title of the book. The title of the book is Native Son. And so what's so interesting about that is why is it Native Son? It's not, you'll notice, immigrant son or person that got brought over and chained son or descendant of slave son, right? It's a native son, right? Is saying Bigger Thomas is an American, right? He's not, he's not an American son. He's just an American out there. And then as he's describing this in an essay he wrote later on, how, or a speech he gave, how Bigger was born, he notes this, right? Notes this. Above and beyond all this, there was that American part of Bigger, which is the heritage of us all. We live by an idealism that makes us believe, among other things, that every man and woman should have the opportunity to realize himself, to seek his own individual fate and goal, his own peculiar and untranslatable destiny. And I think that's the struggle of Bigger Thomas. He's trying to figure out who am I? What am I as a person? And what Wright is doing here, and this is the great American novel part, He's wrestling with something that Tocqueville talked about in Democracy in America. Tocqueville, when he's touring around Democracy in America, about 100 years before Wright writes the book, notes that democracy leads to this idea of egalitarianism. Egalitarianism leads to this idea of individualism, that we're all individuals now, and, and, and it's me that matters, it's not society that matters. 
And then Tocqueville says that is ultimately destructive to a society. If we're all just individuals, we all separate out from society and we don't interact with anybody any else. And then Tocqueville says the American way of solving this is all of these associations we form. We form these associations, they're all at local levels where we bond together with other people to solve various problems. And that's the tension of native son. Bigger Thomas, as he's discovering his individuality, has no associations he can join. The society has deprived him of any ability to join with anybody, to become part of a local community, to, to interact, to help out solve problems in the world. And this is epitomized with, with Mr. Dalton. Mr. Dalton, who sort of stands in, he's not one of the ardent racist types in the book. He's really well-meaning, but what he wants to do is he wants to send money to help educate you know, the people that are black, but but he doesn't want to hire them after they're educated. He sends ping pong tables to sort of community organizations because ping pong tables are clearly what everybody's groping for. But but at no point is Bigger Thomas involved in, in a community with Mr. Dalton. There's no interaction there. And so Bigger Thomas discovering his individuality is left with what? And that's the violence. And suddenly you see the violence of Bigger Thomas coming out. There's no other outlet for his individualism. It just, he's killed Mary. He's discovered this gives him his hidden meaning. And then in the end, we find the actual murder he commits of Bessie is the epitome of the self-indulgent murder, right? Bessie's death does no good for anybody. It doesn't advance any social cause. It doesn't improve the society. There's no way to spin it as anything other than Bigger Thomas just indulging in yet another masturbatory fantasy. He's going to do this thing and then somebody else can clean up the mess later on. And so Wright is wrestling with this, what does one do with Bigger Thomas as he discovers he's a person if we don't have a society around him? The only hint in the book of a solution to this problem is the communists. Maybe the communists will provide a way out. But even there, we begin to see the hints that Wright is beginning to recognize, even in this novel, the problems that will lead to him leaving the Communist Party. And it shows up beautifully in the passage, the long passage that James mentioned at the end, when Max gives up to give his giant defense of Bigger Thomas in the courtroom scene. And it goes on for pages. But what's fascinating about the defense is Max starts off basically by saying, I'm not here to talk about Bigger Thomas, the individual. Max just wants to talk about Bigger Thomas as a representative of this larger class of people and proceeds through a page after page after page, never acknowledging the individuality of the guy sitting there, right? He's just not even a person. And then what happens right later on, he's in the Communist Party, he wants to be a novelist, and the communists basically come along and tell him, no, you can't be a novelist, right? We don't need novelists. We need people to write little communist tracts. And Wright wants to go read books, and they tell him, no, 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 you can't just go pick whatever books you want to read. You need to read the books approved by the party. And so Wright breaks with the communists because they too won't recognize his individuality. And then the irony then of watching Wright's life is then when he publishes his autobiography, the entire section about leaving the communist party, the book of the month club once again comes along and asks him to drop all of that part because all they want to hear about is his struggles of race when he's young, right? And so you see this repeatedly in Wright's life. Right after he finished Native Son, he, was, or he wrote another novel, The Man Who Lived Underground, which the Library of America just also published. And Wright described that novel to his friend and his, his editor, right, that this was his attempt to go beyond the straight black and white stuff. He was trying to write a novel about something other than race relations. And it is this wild existentialist nightmare and sort of all these Nietzschean themes. And the publisher didn't want it. And so we have here this struggle going on of can you be an individual or do you need to be part of a group? And I don't think Wright ever solves this problem in his own life. I mean, it's sort of this interesting problem. You know, he ends up going to Paris and and. And who is he? I mean, I think he's wrestling with this his whole life. But the reason then that makes this novel particularly great, I think, and sort of elevates it up to discussion is this is very much the same problems we're facing today, right? We, we look out at today's society and we see um, this massive polarization. And if you listen to the people, everybody is saying, I'm an individual. I'm a person here that matters. And all of my opponents are these anonymous drones that are a member of some group. They're the deplorables or they're the woke. And we don't have any of this sort of attempt to get these mediating institutions of how do we mediate all these individuals that have all these differences that divide us all the time. And I think that's what Native Son is wrestling with. And I think that's what makes it the great American novel. All right. Thank you. That was a, a sudden conclusion to that. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Root, may I ask if you would be willing to give the third talk?
I'm happy to. And uh, thank you very much to the National Association of Scholars for, for inviting me to participate. Thanks to everyone uh, for tuning in. I'm happy, very happy to be here. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about politics and literature, which is uh, two things that don't always fit well together, don't always play well together. Um, I think we can all think of a, of a novel, a short story, a film that has a political message that we might agree with or be sympathetic to or open to, but the, but the, but the work itself is so heavy handed, it's so preachy, uh, the characters are one dimensional, especially the bad guys, um, and that, that it doesn't work as literature. May work, might work as an op-ed or something like that, but it doesn't work as, as literature. And this is a charge that's been leveled uh, repeatedly against Native Son over the years. Uh, James Baldwin was, was had some criticisms of the book and he, and, he's, and he called it a mere protest novel and kind of making some of, the, some of those criticisms I just made. And I think if you look at this story, at least on the surface, you, you, might, you might be concerned that, that some of those charges could be true. You think about some of the major characters in the book that are sort of driving Bigger Thomas's story. You have uh, Mr. Dalton, uh, the capitalist. He's sort of standing for capitalism. You know, he's this upstanding capitalist figure, but he's also a slumlord. And so one of the social forces operating on Bigger Thomas is capitalism. And so this character stands for that. Uh, his wife is sort of... Uh, 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 clueless white liberalism, you might say, you know, the, she's giving all this money to causes, but is, is literally blind and sort of figuratively blind to, to, to social problems before her. Obviously, the district attorney in the book, this is he's literally the face of a racist state. Um, so this this can start to sound a little one dimensional, I think. And I think what really rescues the novel from from that charge is the character of Bigger Thomas himself. You he's he's fully drawn. His life is, is very granular, uh, it's, it's very gritty, but you're really, you're spending time with him. You are, you are with this character, you're in his head. And so this is a book about root causes, root causes of why Bigger Thomas is doing what he does, why he thinks what he does, uh, the root causes of his crimes. And, and so you are experiencing these root causes acting on him by spending hundreds of pages with this man as, as, he's, as he's going through life and as he's facing these things. And I think that that uh, elevates it and, and makes, it, makes it in a very effective and a great political novel in many ways that even if you, you could have your disagreements, well, I don't think religion works that way because a black church is criticized in the book. Well, I don't think religion works that way. I don't think capitalism works that way. I don't think, I don't think the law is like that. Uh, you can have these criticisms, but, but it's the, the character and his life experience is drawn in such a way that you're really, you're really grappling with it because you're seeing, seeing the world through his eyes and you're in fact, you're sort of experiencing the forces act on him and you see the ways that he's responding and he's not necessarily aware of it. I think that's a, that's a very effective um, political, political message and argument that's, that's being made in that way, whether you agree with it or not. And um, the other thing I think that's, that's so effective about the character of Bigger Thomas is that he is, this is not a nice guy. This is uh, this is not a sympathetic character. This this I don't know if he's the least sympathetic protagonist in in a great work of literature, but he's got to be up there. Uh, we've talked about some of his crimes. I mean, he he rapes and murders his girlfriend while he's on the run to cover his own tracks. That whatever you think of the root causes and how they're acting upon this guy, that's a that's horrific. That's a horrible horrible crime, and and that's by design. That's by Richard Wright's. That that is by design. That this is this is this is not this is not a an innocent man railroaded by the system. You know this is this is a guy who is who's who's very unlikable. He's a bully. He's mean to his friends. There's you can run down the list. There's a lot of unlikable, unsympathetic things about him. And there's also an interesting yeah. question of guilt uh, and innocence. I think um, I'm certainly not the first person to read this book and come away thinking that. Richard, that, that, that Bigger Thomas, maybe, maybe he could have committed the rape. He, he's not, he does not rape and kill Mary Dalton. He murders her accidentally. He's in her room and her mother comes in and, and he knows it's a death sentence or he fears it's a death sentence just to be in that place at that time. And so he accidentally kills her. But because of the way the body's disposed of, uh, the, the, the public mind immediately goes to, well, this is a sex crime. There's... I think that there's, a, there's an implication in the book that Bigger could have done something like this in that moment. That's what I mean by unsympathetic. Now, he, he does, in fact, commit a rape and murder later in the book, so we know he's capable of it. And so, it, this, is, so this, is, this is someone who's, who's, who's facing these social forces, is being shaped by them. You know, that's the whole argument of the book. And he's not likable. You know, he's not an innocent man railroaded. And I think that, that makes it 
very powerful as a work of, of political fiction. And it's something that, that sticks with you and you, and you think about and, and you think about yourself in, in, in his shoes and, 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 and something like that. So I think that's, that's a way it succeeds. Um, probably the strongest piece of evidence against my position would be uh, the, the communist lawyer, Max, his courtroom speech at the end. That is, um, I think it goes on too long. It's, it, it is very much uh, to me, Richard Wright sort of stepping forward and saying, okay, I've spent hundreds of pages showing and not telling, and now I'm going to tell. I'm going to just tell you what this book's about. This book's about, about these social forces acting on this guy, and this lawyer is going to, is going to say all of that. So I, I do think that um, that's, a, that's a mark against what I'm saying here, but I think the, the, the weight of the rest of the book out, outweighs that and the way that there's so much showing going on and done so effectively. Um, this another point about communism and Professor Hartley uh, uh, just was talking about this, right, was a member of the Communist Party when he's working on this book and he, and he becomes disenchanted um, with the party for, for the reasons that were just discussed. And I think you can see the, the seeds of that in the character of Jan in the book, because when, when Bigger Thomas, that's the, the communist boyfriend of Mary, when, when Bigger Thomas first meets Jan, Jan is sort of sizing him up and how can I use you? How can the party use you? Because that ultimately is one of Richard Wright's biggest big problems with the party is that they don't see him as, as an individual and they're, you're a cog in the machine, you're a pawn in our game, we want you to do this and do that and not these other things. And Wright says that he ultimately came to realize that if the communists were ever in, in power, came to political power, he'd be convicted of treason and he'd be executed. And he writes that in, in, the, in the 1940s. And, and there's a, I think the seeds of that are there in the Jan character in this book that he's, that he's, he's grappling with those things. And so that's something I think that's, that's politically very interesting about it. And Wright goes on to become a sort of left-wing anti-communist sort of in the mold of George Orwell or something like that. And th this, this novel is very much a, a work of the left and the, the communist critique is, 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 is small. There's the seeds of it, but I think it's there. And I think that's an interesting to think of thing to think about. Um, One of the one of the um, one of the I guess one of the one of the other points I would make about the novels and Richard Wright's impact in general is that you know he's he's a figure of the left as I said and 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 becomes a kind of an Orwell like figure in some ways, but his influence really extends kind of across the political spectrum. To just to give you um, a couple of examples, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, who's probably the most influential. Um, progressive or left of center writer at work in the United States today. His big, his, his big book, Between the World and Me, the title of that is the title of a Richard Wright poem from the 1930s. That's a kind of a very high profile tip of the hat. And, and so that, that, that kind of shows a lineage there. But then go to a, maybe a different place on the political spectrum, uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, in 1987, when, Justice, when Thomas was, he was not a justice yet, he was the head of the EEOC in Washington, D.C., he gave an interview and he was asked, well, what's the most, um, what writer had the most influence on you? What writer had the greatest impact on your thinking? And without hesitating, Thomas said Richard Wright, number one, numero uno, was his, uh, was his exact quote. And he said that one of the things that was so influential was the autobiographical flirtation with communism, because, because Thomas said, you know, I was going off to college and I was worried about that kind of recruitment. And so that, that had a big influence on his thinking. But the other thing that had a big influence on his thinking was that Thomas said, I was an angry young man at that time, and this was an angry book, and, it's, and it spoke to me. And so I guess I would just say, um, in conclusion, so we can, we can get to some questions and discussion, because I think that's always the most fun. Just, I would just say in conclusion that whatever your, your politics are, um, any, any author that can count Ta-Nehisi Coates and Clarence Thomas among his biggest fans, well, that's an author that's, that's surely worth, worth reading and, and spending time with. So uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. Sorry, I, my mute button has somehow gotten uh, out of control for a second there. Thank you all so much. Uh, wonderful to hear from you. And let me see. Everybody, please uh, put in questions into the chat and into the um, you know, question and answer so that I can uh, forward questions from you. Um, question, I suppose, then about audiences immediately. So he's obviously immediately popular amongst you know, the broad American uh, audience. Um, 
how different is his reception amongst African Americans you know, from the broader American audience? Is there immediately a different um, reaction to him, or is there the same sort of acclaim? You know, should is it actually reasonable to ask about are there different reactions amongst the different audiences, black and white? All right. <laughs> okay. So, in fact, this is just the um, oh one that is okay. Um, I thought it was a good question. Somebody will give it a good answer. Uh, I go to therefore go on to a question um, from uh, Carolyn Gannon. Um, as Damon Root points out, from the outset, Wright didn't create bigger. Um, as a heroic figure defined completely by the effects of poverty, racism, classism, or ideology, but rather a young man who was kind of a shyster and more, even among his friends. Why did Wright choose to develop such an honest portrayal? Well, um, it, Wright said that he he didn't he he had he had, he had in earlier fiction he had that there had been sympathetic characters and he's and he was he was actively trying to make sure that no one was going to cry over this guy because that was that you know that was um, that was not he didn't want to write something sentimental um, I guess was one of the things he would say so it's a it's a it's an it's an you know it's an active choice I think it it you know the book opens with an alarm ringing you know it's a wake up call um, for readers and for the country about about this um, this simmering number of bigger Thomases that are out there right um, in in describing the, the 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 genesis of the book he said that he's thinking of of bigger Thomas as the the sort of um, potential foot soldier for for communism in Russia or maybe fascism in Germany, the kind of, this kind of a oppressed, alienated person who uh, some kind of a strongman leader could come and speak to them. And so I think this, this idea that, that um, he is, uh, you know, he's unlike, he's, he's unsympathetic because, the, because the, the dangers of having a society where you have someone like that as, as part of it, who's so excluded, who the society is, is on the one hand, is part of it and, and, and has the same wants and needs and, and feelings and desires as everyone else, but then it's, it's denied at every turn, you know, what that does to someone, the kind of powder keg that that creates. And so I think, I think that's perhaps, you know, sort of part of the, part of the, the, the choice. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting the um the, the comment Damon mentioned earlier, you know, he didn't want people crying. He's it was specifically he didn't want bankers' daughters crying. I mean, that was what bothered him about the reaction. And I think that's what's going on. I'm not sure I would characterize it as an honest portrayal, but he wanted to portray somebody that you don't like, you know, and it starts off right away. The first scene he's writing is the scene where he's got this good friend Gus and they're having this chat, and then you know, within pages, he's holding a knife to Gus's head and forcing Gus to lick the knife, right? I mean, this is just not a sympathetic guy. And I think that was so important because I think Wright wanted everybody to feel something, but what he didn't want is more Mr. and Mrs. Dalton's of saying, oh, these nice people, and we're gonna go do nice things for them. He wanted to point out, these are unsympathetic people. Some of these people are really unsympathetic, and yet we still need to wrestle with what to do with them. I wonder if, um question that David uh, raised earlier about uh, are there more African-American readers of the novel today than, uh, than white readers? Or maybe I'm rephrasing your question. But certainly, um, it's a question in everybody's mind, I think. These novels, Brutality on the Mountain and Native Sun and Invisible Man, they were, they were written for white audiences. And that's where they found their readership. And that's something that's probably changed over the years, it undoubtedly changed over the years. It changed um, in the mid sixties with Amiri Baraka and his black nationalism and so on. And I would be interested to know um, from the American panelists, if they think that books like Native Son and Go Tell and Martin and indeed Baldwin's essays have a, a, a more predominant readership among African-Americans than they did in the past and perhaps even outnumbering white readers. Going once, going twice. 
And my answer is I, I don't know. So that's, a, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. Um, it, there, it, it's thinking back to your book's original reception, I mean, one, one of the, one interesting literary feud uh, at the time was Zora Neale Hurston, the great Harlem Renaissance writer. Uh, her, and Ball, her, and, her and Wright really uh, were not fans of each other's work and had very scathing uh, reviews going back and forth. And, 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 both kind of accuse the other of pandering to white audiences. Uh, Wright accused Hurston of pandering to white readers by just kind of having a, you know, the, this uh, 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 dialect and sort of, um, uh, you know, happy-go-lucky kind of characters, and then and then she accused him of all this violence and sort of titillating white readers and 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 so forth. And um, you know, I, th it's, it's so I think that the, at the the. I think some of those debates are probably still are still happening, um, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to speculate about the the sort of wide readership because I just don't know. I could actually make in charge with another novel. Is it the Great Chicago novel? How does it compare with Saul Bellow? This is, by the way, this is the serious question that we we should not go too quickly to race. How much is it about Chicago? Is it distinctively a Chicago experience, a Chicago black experience, a Chicago black and white experience? Um, you know, should we be talking about that rather than just you know, America as a whole? Any well, native Chicagoans here to speak up on this? <laughs> Chicago is 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 almost a character in the book. I would I would say you know it's it's very present as a city, so it's certainly a great a great Chicago novel. The greatest that's but that's a tough. That's, I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to rank that. Um, but it's very the city is 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 very present and uniquely present. It's it's also informed though by his by his experiences in the South. I mean the 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 um, Jim Crow and Lynch law are 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 are, are looming. Fear, you know, fear motivators throughout the story, and that's something that that Wright sort of brings with him as part of the Great Migration to the North. So it's that's infused into it. So it's not uniquely chi Chicago in that way, but um, but the city's a powerful part of it. Yeah, I think it, it is interesting, right? Because Chicago stands in for sort of a, after the Great Migration after the Civil War, right? Chicago is a prime city for the location, and so the idea of this enclave that's sort of separated out from the rest of the city plays large. There are other cities like that. I've never really thought of Chicago as the most emblematic city like that. I mean, the novel couldn't take place in lots of places. It has to take place in a big American city that's got the, you know, the enclave and the sort of, you know, there's, it's like the belt around it, literally. Um, and so Chicago is the most obvious example of that. But I don't know if it's the great Chicago novel either. It's a... I think um, I don't really believe in the great American novel. There are lots of great American novels, um, really great ones. And I think in among that assembly, this is one of them, but it's not the great American novel. And one thing that is troubling really about Wright's career is why he didn't follow it with another great novel, because he didn't. He followed it with a great uh, memoir, Black Boy, which as Damon has said, was uh, also truncated by Harper and Brothers, possibly to its advantage, um, possibly not. But Wright never really wrote another novel which we are still talking about today. I think it was 13 years be between Native Son and The Outsider, which was his next, next novel. And then the one after The Outsider, by which time he was in Paris, um, curious that it shares the English title of Albert Camus' uh, L'Etranger. I know in America it's called The Stranger, but in in Britain, it's always called The Outsider. Uh, but he followed that with Savage Holiday, which I think is 1955. And that's a novel with no black characters. Um, curiously enough, one year before, if I've got the date right, uh, James Baldwin's novel with no black characters, Giovanni's Room. That's, a, that's something we could also talk about. It does get us a little bit off the point, but. Um, I wonder if the others have views on why Richard Wright wrote another novel that we're not really talking about, as we are certainly talking about this one. Well, my my, my guess is he tried, right? I think I think he probably believed the man who was lived underground was actually going to be his next big novel, 
but it is just so not like Native Son. You know, you're reading it and, you know, it's so, st- the, the closest analogy is like Sartre's nausea or something. I mean, it's just wild just sort of watching this guy wrestle with all of this stuff. And so that's what he was trying to write. He, he made a remark in the essay about, you know, how Bigger was born, that his next novel was going to be about women, right? It wasn't going to be about Blacks. It was going to be about women. I don't think that novel ever showed up anywhere. So I think he wanted to write another novel, but I'm not sure he had another novel in him, in a sense. that you know, he, 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 wrote, he, he wrote lots of them. Sorry to interrupt, Jim. Yeah. Um, he wrote lots of them. I think the novel he wrote after Native Son was called Black Hawk. Uh, which wasn't published, and I think it never been published. He might have written quite a bit of it. And then there were various things. And then throughout the 50s, he never, by the way, when he uh, emigrated to Paris, uh, to, to France, he never returned to America except for a very brief stopover when he was making the film of Native Son, in which Richard Wright, by then about 40, played uh, Bigger Thomas. Uh, and it was shot in Argentina. But he made a brief stopover in America, but apart from that, never returned to the United States. He wrote lots of novels, unfortunately, um, not very successful, including one which remains unpublished called Island of uh, Hallucination, which is supposed to be a novel which involves a lot of people from the Paris scene, including Baldwin, including Chester Himes and uh, Ollie Harrington and uh, a chap called Richard Gibson, who is often mentioned in connection with the controversial death of Richard Wright. And partly for that reason, it, hasn't, it remains unpublished. So he, he did write lots of novels, but, it, but he had difficulties with his agent and with his publisher. You know, they, they didn't want to publish them. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a case of the, the big first novel, which the novelist in a way never quite got over. Mm-hmm. Let's see. So, I, I, it, unless anybody wants to respond to that, I'll go to another question. Um, well, this is a sort of following up, perhaps. I mean, what do you think are the, from Xavier, what do you think are the implications of creating and centering an unrepentant figure? Um, you know, what kinds of social responses, programming, clinicians, scholars, and activists has this figure prompted? And I actually wanted to just be, focus on this very interesting thing, unrepentant. That's slightly different from unsympathetic. Well, you know, they're overlapping you know, points, but unrepentant, what's, what's the effect of that? I, I think, uh, that, importantly, right, the unrepentant doesn't give us that moment when the banker's daughter can cry over him, right? You know, there's all the way till the end, he is unsympathetic because he's unrepentant, right? You know, and that's yeah. the importance of the, the death of Bessie, right? It's There's just no way to justify the death of Bessie as part of anything other than just his own desire to, you know, kill her and, and the way he dumps her down the air shaft and all of that. I mean, it's brutal, right? And, and then because he doesn't ever repent of that and realize the error of his ways, you end the novel and there's no moment at which you say, oh, Poor bigger Thomas, you know, I'm going to weep over his fate. It's one of the things that makes it a gripping novel, I think, on the way through, particularly in the first two parts. Um, it's something that Baldwin never learned, really, uh, particularly in his play Blues from Mr. Charlie, that you've got to make, you've got to create a conflict in the, in the mind of the audience or in the mind of the reader, that the reader knows uh, that he or she shouldn't really be sympathizing with this character because of these dreadful acts, which Jim has just outlined, which we all know, those of us who have read the novel recently. But at the same time, we know also the bigger is a victim of horrible historical circumstances, and although he, his, his particular character doesn't inspire sympathy in us, nevertheless, there's some kind of, um, some kind of kindness in the, the mind of the reader that wants to say, um, well, I understand. And yet then he goes and does something 
even more dreadful. So to speak. And it's, it, it, it's a great novelistic device because it keeps you, it keeps you in suspense. You, you know, this, this fellow is dreadful. And yet, in a very, very, in, in, in a little corner of your heart, you're on his side. And it's, it's a terrific device on the part of a novelist. It's something that Baldwin never learned. And he was told that when, uh, when they were doing Blues for Mr. Charlie in New York, you know, because all the black guys are goodies and all the white guys are baddies. And, ah, oh, come on, man. Uh, the audience knew that when they came in. <laughs> You've got to change their minds by the time they get out. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. Somebody's going to say something? I'm actually going to follow up with a question. Is the lack of repentance actually particularly an American theme? And so I'm going to give you just some comparisons. Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess, another uh, you know, novel about somebody very unsympathetic, where famously the last chapter of the English version has him begin to mature. The American version ends short one chapter, you know, un, you know, repentant, oh, was I ever cured? Or we can also add um, Cormac McCarthy, No Country for Old Men, uh, the Anton Chigurh character as not overwhelmingly uh, filled with your know, remorse, compassion, conscience, and so on. So is this actually, is it the great American novel precisely because Bigger Thomas does feel no remorse? Or is it at any rate a characteristically American novel? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question, but when, when you're asking it, it immediately prompted another possibility in my mind that the unrepentant nature is a statement in some ways about religion, right? So Wright also is wrestling with religion and the terrors of religion and all of this. Repentance is this, this Christian thing, right? You've sinned and you repent for it. And so by not having a repentance, this is also another way of de-Christianizing bigger that sort of he's also rebelling against christian and, you know there is that scene in the jail where the, the the preacher comes in the black preacher comes in he's just like just you know say you're sorry here and his bigger one's no part of it so i have no idea the american thing is interesting but it also may be just part of the religious the stand against religion yes i don't think lack of repentance is a particularly american theme or particularly European theme or a particularly Scottish theme. Lots of uh, unrepentant people in Scottish history. <laughs> uh, and, and no doubt it's universal. Um, no, I don't think that comes into it. In my view, it doesn't come into it. Wright's great achievement was to, 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 to focus on this particular grievance um, and to, Elizabeth, to personify it in the character of Bigger Thomas and not to make him a sympathetic character, as, just, as, as, as Damon said earlier. Um, it, it's funny to say so, but that was as part of the great achievement of the novel that, um, that we don't like Bigger Thomas. So it keeps us guessing in a way. We're, we're, we're not smiling and, and, and congratulating ourselves by uh, loving this fellow at the center of the book, we're, 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 we're putting the book down and going away and questioning our own responses to it. That's what any novelist would want you to do. Well, by the way, actually, so I was going to follow up with by a chain of free association. What precisely were the books that Richard Wright was reading as he wrote this? I mean, you know, what are his precise and particular influences? I mean, do we know this? Oh, the one thing he talks about that right before this is he just read Mencken and and discovered mm -hmm. Mencken's you know ability to use wor words as weapons right and I think that that is very clearly showing up on all of his early writing um, that he's just discovered you can assault America to know tomorrow just by using words. I think he was influenced by uh, the great realists of the time Steinbeck. Uh, James Farrell, he, Wright, Wright was a rather rough and ready writer, I think, 
and became maybe more so as time went on. And when he tried to become a stylist, uh, it wasn't always successful, although I do very much like uh, the novel that he wrote before Native Son, Lord Today, which is set in the post office and Wright himself worked in the post office. Actually, it's a, it's a very enjoyable novel and it has uh, influences from another um, writer of Steinbeck's generation, John Dodd Passos. It has influences from USA, the news, so-called newsreel technique where um, news items are interspersed in the text. And I think it's done very well. It wasn't published until after Wright's death, unfortunately. I happen to know that it was Baldwin's favorite novel among Wright's uh, novels. And um, Mrs. Wright told me that uh, just before Baldwin's death, uh, there was going to be a new edition of Lord Today and Baldwin was going to write an introduction, which would have been a, a nice um, reconciliation, posthumous, alas, between uh, the old black writer and the new black writer, as they were in Paris in the late 40s. But alas, Baldwin uh, died before that could happen. But Lord Today is a terrific novel. But it, it's, I think it's the realists, yeah, those Passos and Steinbeck and Farrell, they, these were his boys. It, it wasn't Hemingway and Fitzgerald, you know, the, the finer writers. I don't know, Damon. Do you have any views on that? No, I, 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 I sort of agree. I agree with that. I was. I think that's that sounds right to me. All right. Well, let's see. So, by the way, there is a, a comment also. How about crime and punishment, y'all? From Stephen. I know that, which is, after all, you know, the great novel of indeed, you know, you know malicious, you know, consciousless crime, but then yes, remorse. I mean, isn't it actually then in some sense a comment also on crime and punishment or yeah, these just happen to be themes that recur? No, he was influenced by Dostoevsky. He, he definitely was. He had read these things. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I'm old, so I'll check. There is, by, by the way, a book um, put together by Michel Fabre, who wrote a biography of Richard Wright, uh, the French writer and academic Michel Fabre. He died about 10 years ago. Um, and he wrote a biography of Richard Wright, he was a Richard Wright scholar living in Paris. He wrote originally his biography in French. It wasn't the first biography of Wright, but um, he also put together a book, which I think it's called, I've got it upstairs, it's called Richard, I think it's called Richard Wright's Books. And it's a kind of, you know, it's a kind of bibliography. It's a listing of Richard Wright's books. And if anybody's interested, uh, you can no doubt find it, as you can find everything nowadays. Um, and it, so it's his library, really. But I think it's called Richard Wright's Books. So that would give some idea of what he was reading, what was in on his shelves when he died, when uh, when Michel Faber was able to have access to them. I think we'll just, I'll, I would like to just say one thing. It goes for Baldwin too, by the way. Um, we don't have an edition of Richard Wright letters. Hmm. And I think this is a lack. Uh, I know that Michel Faber, I was just reminded of it there, mentioning his name. Michel Faber had put together an edition of Richard Wright's letter, ready for publication. And Mrs. Wright, Ellen Wright, uh, withdrew permission late on in the process. So it probably exists somewhere. I don't know if it could be resuscitated and published. As for Baldwin's letters, people have been calling for a long time, including me, uh, for their publication. Whether that will happen, I, I don't know. That's, another, that's a, a subject for another edition of this webinar. Does he does he talk about the writing process in his letters, you know, of uh, Native Son? He probably does. I haven't had the opportunity to read them all. They aren't, they aren't published. I, I have got some letters by him, written by him, um, including letters between him and Baldwin early on, which were interesting. 
I, he undoubtedly does. You know, he was very free in his uh, way of talking about things and free of free in um, expressing himself in respect of his writing process. So I, I think that he does it. I, I think it would be a fascinating volume. Maybe somebody would, here would like to uh, try and restart it. This will be part of the NAS's uh, commissioned letters of famous authors to accompany our Great American Literature webinar series. Uh, that'll, that'll be fun to apply for funding for. Um, oh dear, oh, let's see. There is a question about the unfulfilled American dream and its raw, sad consequences. A native son compared to grapes of wrath. You know, this is from Richard Morgan. Yes. Would he actually had time to read Grapes of Wrath before he wrote it? I guess I mean, we're given that you know, we do have the long communist speech. We're also given that he has the critique. Um, does he have, in, you know, Richard Wright, any sort of positive American dream in there? Is there simply a critique of its failure? Does he have some sort of portrayal of what it should be, if only implicitly? I mean, I think that is part of the problem, right? I mean, it's sort of he 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 doesn't have a solution, right? If you if you don't buy Max's long speech at the end as the cure for all of this, and it's not clear right buys Max's speech at the end, you know, I think that's that maybe part of the reason it just keeps going and going and going is right standing in trying to say, as David pointed out, let me tell you what this book is all about, and and it's not concise. It sort of becomes this sprawling, meandering, weaving in and out thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know that there is a an optimistic tone to this book somewhere that like, oh, yes, and if we just did this, things will be great. And that's partly because Bigger doesn't have the sympathetic thing. It's hard to imagine Bigger in the sequel kind of turning out, you know, he escapes the death penalty and becomes a, you know, a virtuous member of society leading people to happen. I just, I can't even imagine this, right? I mean, there's no good end for bigger here. Well, isn't the, isn't the, the sequel is the autobiography of Malcolm X, the guy goes to prison and, and, um, and becomes radicalized in a, a political way. I, I, I was thinking about, there was the question earlier, um, which I think is related to what we're talking about now of, you know, people who want to have a positive program change, you know, reading this book, what it, what it, what did we get to? And, and, you know, Malcolm X did give this famous answer when he was, you know, he was asked, well, what can, you know, what can white people do to help the nation of Islam and your cause? I, you know, and he said nothing. And then I think he, he conceded at one point that there was one white person, this is in his most radical militant phase, not later in his life, but there was one white person he said, okay, maybe was, was, um, was an ally to us. And that was John Brown. Um, the radical abolitionist, but otherwise, you know, everybody else fell short. And, and, you know, this is, this is a book that has that kind of a, kind of a stark, um, uh, maybe message is not the right word there, but, but that, that, that kind of a, a feeling to it, um, because it's, it's about root causes and s systemic racism and, and, and capitalism itself as this, um, just oppressive institution. And so you kind of have to dismantle all of society to get to get to something better. And, and it's sort of nothing short of that is gonna work is um, it's, it's not sort of said directly, but that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of in there. And so that's, uh, um, I think that is why the, the, you know, it's the chickens come home to roost to the, to the white liberal parents. That's sort of one of the things that happens in, in the story there. They're, they're giving money to these causes. I know there's the ping pong tables and, you know, and, and education, and we can send you to college. And, and um, that's not gonna, you know, Wright's message is that's not gonna do the trick. And um, so, and so the people who are, who are, who are, who are reading this book and who would, who would think about those kind, of, those kind of solutions, it's not, it's not gonna work. And the book really lays out, lays it out that it's, that it's not going to, at least that's the, that's, that's the message. Yeah, I don't think Richard Wright uh, had in mind any kind of American dream, uh, either fulfilled or unfulfilled. It was an American nightmare, really. Um, in the character of Bigger Thomas, didn't really have any dreams at all, uh, other than get, going to bed at night and getting up in the morning. And in a way, that's the, the message of the book. In a, in a way, that's the 
great achievement of the book that it makes the reader see this uh, horrifyingly limited perspective of this character that we are obliged to live with throughout the whatever it is, 400 pages of the book. Um, I think dreams don't come into it. No, not at all. Not, not even, not even, not even bad dreams, except in the sense that the whole thing is a bad dream. Except it it's a reality. It's not a bad dream. It's a bad reality. Yeah, and it was interesting in, in doing this, you know, and back and looked at the Tocqueville passages about the individualism. And as Tocqueville is describing this, I mean, that's exactly what James is saying, right? The, the, the individualist thing is I retreat from society. I just decide I have no part of anything around me. And I think that's exactly where bigger emerges in this is this is the nightmare. Like what happens if society dissolves and we're just left with all these people that have nothing but their rage and there's no other way to have outlets to any of it. Okay. I am going to follow up with a completely different question from the audience, uh, Richard Morgan again. Why did Ralph Ellison not like the guy? And by the, is that Ellison or um, Baldwin who, who didn't care for him or both? Both. All right, so, so two major writers really oh didn't like him. It was complicated, it wasn't that simple, but sorry, go on. Well, actually, then you said Zora Neale Hurston had words from two, so clearly he got negative reactions from his uh, peers. No end. What, what was what, so? What was the gravamen of their dislike? Uh, well, with Baldwin, um, it was very complicated. Uh, first of all, he was indebted to Richard Wright. Uh, Richard Wright got him a fellowship, which enabled Baldwin to go to Paris, where uh, he. One of the first people he met was Richard Wright, who was living happily and affluently in Paris, and Baldwin was practically penniless. Um, and the the essay, everybody's protest novel, was originally destined for partisan review, but Baldwin published it first in a little magazine in Paris called Zero which was edited by a man called Themistocles Poetus. And Baldwin and he became friends. And everybody's protest now, I think it was published in the autumn of 1947, or maybe in the spring of 1948, in Zero. In, and it was followed in the magazine by uh, the man who lived underground, by Richard Wright. And Baldwin's criticisms of Richard Wright's general worldview were perfectly illustrated by the man who lived underground, the short story in Zero. So here we had the great black writer in Paris, and here we had the new arrival criticizing him. The son must slay the father. And Wright never forgave him. Um, Baldwin didn't really like Wright all that much. Baldwin was a complicated figure, especially in those, well, all his life, of course, but um, his, his complications were fairly complicated during his life in Paris by poverty. And Richard Wright's life at that time was not complicated by poverty. So um, you can probably guess uh, the outcome there, but Baldwin occasionally borrowed money from Richard Wright and Richard Wright advantage of this. So there was, there, there, there was a very, um, gosh, uh, there was a dynamic going on there which wasn't very pleasant. And it lasted until the end of Richard Wright's life. Uh, and maybe he was an awkward character get, to get on with. Ellison, had, also was indebted to Richard Wright. Richard Wright, you know, as I said at the very beginning, this was an American first. There was nothing like Native Son before 1940. So it was, it's a great novel in that respect, in addition to others. Um, and Ellison was also indebted to him, not only in a literary sense, because Rick Wright had gone and paved the road, but also in other senses. Ellison arrived in Harlem, 
and Richard Wright was kind to him. And um, as many as Cynic has said, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, but I think Ellison was um, aesthetically highly principled. He was certainly wrote one of the great novels. Um, and he, in a way, he couldn't quite forgive Wright for, uh, maybe for helping him too much, but uh, he, he didn't like Wright's aesthetics in the end, I think. So, so they fell out, and maybe Wright was an awkward guy. Yeah. There is, a, by the way, there's an unpublished speech still unpublished, which Wright made the American church in Paris in 1959, in which he discusses these relations. He discusses his relations with Baldwin, whose name uh, he misspells throughout the text of the speech uh, as Baldwin, B-A-L-W-I-N, he misses out the D. And Chester Himes, whom he portrays as a kind of knife-wielding bug, and Ellison. And he outlines all his uh, differences with them. It's a, it's a fascinating thing. As I, I, as I say, it's still unpublished, but Ellen Wright did give me permission to publish part of it in my book about, uh, about Paris. So there's a little bit of it in there. Um, so th there were things going on among them all all the time. Right. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't a necessarily happy, but a productive one. They were all good writers. One big unhappy family. <laughs> well, yes and no. You know, Baldwin came round in the end. He wrote uh, an obituary of Wright, which was pretty tough. But um, then later on, he would say, how could I possibly criticize Richard's great novel? You know, I wasn't even in a position to criticize it, rather disingenuous. Um, but I think, um, you know, I, I, I think people's feelings about their competitors and about their elders, they change as they get older and, uh, and as they become more successful themselves and more than become more successful than right ever been. So it was possible then to be more congenial towards her and more kind. The same between Baldwin and Ellison. Um, it was even worse. There was no, there was no love lost there. And it, and it was never really reconciled. But, but Baldwin would say, oh yeah, you know, I love this great novel. How could I not? Indeed. You know, it's always like that. So I have a well a teaching question, if I may, which I, I'm going to think expand into an audience question. When students now, this is this has to be more for Professor Hartley in the student sense. When students now read um, Native Son, gosh, what do they get out of it? What needs to be explained? You know, what for the you know, the eighteen year old student in twenty twenty two, you know, resonates, and what is just what on earth is this about? Because so much time has passed, and I guess I will say I will expand that to audiences in general, and you know, for our other two panelists. But you know, so, so how does how does that strange species, the eighteen year old, react to this novel? So I've never actually taught this novel to in a class, but I can tell you, I mean, I, I know exactly what happened. The problem with 18 year olds now is all books are mirrors, right? So they, they read a book and they just see their own prejudices reflected in the book. And so the challenge, not with this book, but just with all books like this is getting them to realize maybe this book has other themes. Maybe it's wrestling with other issues than the ones you just are projecting into it. So, and that's just, it's a giant challenge right now with, with college students. Right. And I, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt Damon. No, 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 I, 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 okay. I, I, no, I just wanted to. Uh, I, I wondered as I was rereading the book. Um, 
you know, we, we read all these stories all the time about students walking out and not only that, but professors being disciplined and um, put on uh, and suspended from teaching merely for quoting James Baldwin. And I'm not going to uh, cause a sensation by uttering the word in this because we don't get, we don't get thrown off YouTube, but merely for uh, uttering the N-word when quoting from the fire next time. Uh, that happened, uh, as you no doubt know, to a U, uh, NYU professor. And reading uh, Native Son again, it's all over the place, you know, the so-called N-word. Um, and possibly my favorite novelist of all time, William Faulkner, um, I just read Absalom, Absalom, which is, it isn't really a novel. It's a, it's a, it's a phenomenon in nature. It's a climactic event, really. Um, one of the greatest things, not just one of the greatest novels I've ever read, but one of the greatest experiences I've ever had reading that damn thing. Um, how on earth, and maybe Jim can tell me, maybe Damon can tell us, how is it possible to uh, talk to students about these things? Now, like, because it's a mystery to me. Sound and the Fury to me is one of the greatest books ever written. How is it possible to talk about these things in universities today? I, I, I know by the answer to that. <laughs> Sorry? I wish I knew the answer to that. That That is the problem, right? It's like... <laughs> you mean it's impossible? Mm -hmm. You mean it's impossible? <laughs> I haven't given up hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Damon, do you? Do well, I'm not. I'm not at the university, so I can't. I can't speak to that. No, but, but what do you think about that? Um, I, there's. I think there's always a challenge with um, with different you know sensibilities at different times. I think you can you can you can discuss hard concepts. Um, you can you can perhaps set up a set up some make make clear what you're going to be talking about ahead of time so students are students are aware and they don't feel like they're caught unprepared. But like I said, I'm not since I'm not teaching students, I don't know what their objections are or would be or not. So I don't want to I don't want to speculate on that. Um, so I'll leave it I'll leave it there. I, the NAS's day job is you understand to try to make it easier for professors to teach everything without fear. So we are in the business of trying to be a courage stimulant for all interested readers. However, that's, that's the day job, as I say. I'm just gonna say that I know that Professor Hartley said he had to leave at 2.52. We normally just have like a sort of a final thing to say from everybody. I, I think I'll just go to that now, if I may, just a few last things to say, Professor Hartley, you first before you have to dash. So I, I think, I mean, I think this discussion illustrated, I think, what makes Richard Wright's novel rise above the sort of generic, you know, you can read it as a sort of period piece, but but it really does weave in all these deeper themes and sort of wrestling with the character of Bigger Thomas or so on is something that's valuable. So, so in terms of like thinking about your 18 year old student reading it, I think James is on the right thing, like having to wrestle with what do you do with a character who's unlikable, who breaks all of what you want the character to be is exactly what elevates this novel up above the pedestrian. Um, it's it's just a novel well worth reading. I mean, it looks long, but it's a very fast read. I mean, Wright has a, a wonderful prose style that just sort of flows right along. And it does have that compelling narrative, even if you know how it all wraps up. So it's, it's, it is truly a great novel, I would say. Thank you. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, Mr. Campbell, next, I guess. It certainly is a great novel. Um, it's um, There are certain novels that are inevitable. And it's an inevitable novel. It is very hard to imagine American literature without Native Son. Uh, it's, it's worth reading. It's, it, Certainly, uh, as it's worth reading Black Boy, it's worth reading Richard Wright's other novels, and it's worth exploring uh, the, the trajectory that Richard Wright had in Paris, because that in itself is fascinating. Um, and trying to understand why he went to Paris and what he found there. 
and all his fallings out with Baldwin and all that kind of thing. All of the, that stuff is instructive. Uh, it's, not, it's not just gossip. It really is um, instructive about the, the chapters of American literature, both before the war and after the war. So uh, just by the very existence of these people, um, Baldwin and Wright, and their circle and the, the great works they wrote, um, I feel hugely indebted to them. You know, I, goodness knows what my life would have been like without them. <laughs> and that includes Native Sun. Yes, it's a, it's a terrific book. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Root. Well, I, I, I think everyone's made a, made a very good case for why it's a great, great novel. I, I guess just to add to that, um, it's, you can, you, this is a book you can read today and feel like you're talking about uh, very present day concerns. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of a, you know, ripped from the headlines uh, aspect to it, not the, not the specifics, but okay. this, the, the, the conversations okay. we're having now about, about race right. and economics, justice, all, all sorts of things. Um, so I think it could be a, I would imagine could be um, a great, a great spark for classroom discussion for, for anyone who's, who's, who's engaged in, in political debates now. So it's, it's, and, it, and it's interesting to see how arguments just kind of keep coming up and coming around throughout American history. You can go back further in literature and find things that people are arguing about long ago and that are still ringing bells today. And, and this, is a, this is a book that, that really has that in spades, I think, and, and makes it um, still very compelling. And, and the little aspects of it, I suppose, that are dated and, and you might need to explain a little bit of the history and the context. But um, I think in, in the big themes and the way it hits and actually in a lot of the stuff people are arguing about right now, um, it really feels very, very contemporary. Thank you so much. Look, thank you all so much. Um, I'll just repeat to everybody. Uh, one, we have more webinars in the Great American Literature Series coming up. So keep you know, stay tuned uh, for those. So we will continue to be uh, doing them. Um, I believe our next one is May 24th to Kill a Mockingbird. Um, if there's another one next week, I apologize, but I don't think so. Um, if you have leftover questions, send them to me, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L, -L, there's two L's there, at nas.org, I will forward them uh, to the participants so they can have the option to reply to you. You can look at this from within 24 hours on our NAS YouTube channel. And then just finally, um, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to the audience. We do this for you. We can't do it without you. The questions are yours, but a few of mine. Um, and so we need you. Thank you so much. And then finally, to our participants, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful um, 90 minutes. I'm very, very happy that you could um, share your insights into a great American novel. Thank you.